Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Nexa Front Lawn for No Presence, Please. That's with guest speakers Jayant Kaikini in conversation with Mahesh Rao. Jayant Kaikini is a multi-award winning Canada writer, poet, playwright, and lyricist. He has published 20 books, including most recently, No Presence, Please, Mumbai Stories, which has also been translated into English. He'll be appearing in conversation with Mahesh Rao, a novelist and short story writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and many other publications. He won the Tata First Book Award for Fiction, and his second novel, Polite Society, has just been published to critical acclaim. Please join me in inviting to the stage Jayant Kaikini and Mahesh Rao. This session is unusual in the sense that it's only a half hour slot and we will allow for a brief Q&A towards the end of the session. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here uh, talking to Jayanth Kekini uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're here on a very auspicious occasion because just two days ago, Jayanth won the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature for this book, uh, for this collection of short stories. And it was the uh, first ever translation to win the prize. So, so we're greatly honored to be here, um, to be able to talk to you about this, this wonderful book. Um, these stories uh, are subtitled Mumbai Stories, and they are drenched with the sights and sounds and smells of Mumbai, Bombay. Um, and it's not the, the Mumbai or the Bombay of cliche, the, the Malabar Hill story or the Marine Drive story. These are located in really specific corners of the city, the alleyways of Mulund or the uh, Charles of Shivajinagar. And so I wanted to start, uh, Jayant, by asking you about the early days. Uh, you were born in Gokarna in Karnataka and you moved to uh, Mumbai in the 70s. Yeah. So what was that like for you? What were your early impressions of the city? Uh, first of all, uh, namaskar to everyone here. And hi, Mahesh. Namaskara Nimugu Kuda. Egidira. It was, see, Bombay, we belong to north part of Karnataka, which was in an earlier Bombay residency. So for us, Bombay was very dear to our mind, mindscape, than Bangalore. So going to Bombay was a logical extension of anybody's education looking for a job. That's how I landed up in Bombay. So Bombay was something like, you know, it suddenly, I always use a metaphor, when you wash a t-shirt with very bold prints, after washing it, when you put it for drying, you do it ulta. You, you know, ulta and you, you dry it. Same way, this Bombay made me completely inside out. It just exposed me to a new space and it really it liberated me from my biodata, my rubber stamp, or my letterhead, or even my, you can call, email ID. Uh, so, uh, one thing that uh, I noticed, um, the, your translator, Tejaswari Niranjana, who we should also congratulate for doing such a superb uh, job with this translation. Yeah. Um, in her translator's note, uh, she says that your characters, they do not represent a unified linguistic constituency. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is really interesting because your mother tongue is Konkani and you write about stories that are, uh, or in this collection anyway, that have been set in uh, Mumbai. So Kannada would not be necessarily the natural language of your characters, um, but there are also touches of Hindi or more specifically Bombaya that come into your stories and English. So there's a very delicate negotiation of a number of languages in the way that you travel through the cityscape. How do you negotiate that? Yeah, I think for we Indians, 
this multilingual sensibility is a biggest virtue anyone in india can know or talk minimum at least four languages so when i was in bombay i spoke in konkani at home my mother tongue is konkani when i went in local trains i talked in hindi and marathi with my commuters friends when i go to my office i talked in english and i came back to my home and wrote in kannada see all the characters whom i met who really you know uh, affected me they came into my stories and they talked in kannada but there was no problem for me and there is a big problem as you say if the dialogues come in your narrative if there is you know sambhashane dialogues come which language he spoke speaks whether there should be a tonality of a gujarati fellow spoke speaking kannada or he is something different and he is talking a, uh, you know language of communication of that story so it's very tricky but somehow i got through that and all of my stories they talk in their own kannada so so that adds the flavor to it and i retained some of the hindi words like maro goli tufan or all these things because bombay is a big spiritual place for me you know because that is the only place where the language you know like aapko tumko has been replaced by tere ko mere ko it entire city talks in singular so there is a kind of a you know uniformity there very liberating space so that liberates a writer because you are open to a very wide human space which is very intense and which is very absorbing i i did notice that when your characters have something saucy to say or when they talk about for example their daughter's virginity they talk in english so is english the language of sex oh no the thing is the certain things when they are in english they are away from us like we keep on telling shit shit it can never be done in your own language <laughs> so because then it comes very close to you <laughs> so that's why these things these tools automatically in narrative whatever we don't really relish telling it in our language which were whichever takes us to our context very deeply we push it by such things it naturally happens well we've we've talked about the the closeness of language so i think that's a a good time to do a reading sure. um so jayant has very kindly agreed to uh, do a short reading in canada and i will read the translation of the same passage uh i'll read it in kannada i could have read any damn thing <laughs> but there are few kannada friends here so i will read from my story only <laughs> i am uh, reading with uh, this is from a story called uh, uh, city without mirrors shalini shalini sen hesarige no holapide ಕಳೆದ ಮೂವತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತು ವರ್ಷಗಳಿಂದ ಇದೇ ಗ್ರಹದ ಮೇಲೆ ವಾಸಿಸುತ್ತ ಬಂದಿರುವ ಈ ಶಾಲಿನಿ ಸೇನ್ಲ ವರ್ತಮಾನ ಹಠಾತ್ತನೇ ಈಗ ಸತ್ಯಜಿತ್ ದತ್ತಾನ ವರ್ತಮಾನದ ಸಮೀಪ ಸುಳಿಯುವ ಚೋದ್ಯ ಅದೆಂಥದು ಊಳಿಗಕ್ಕೆಂದೇ ಈ ಶಹರಕ್ಕೆ ವಲಸೆ ಬಂದು ನೆಲೆ ಊರಿದ ಅಥವಾ ನೆಲೆಯೇ ಊರಿರದ ಕುಟುಂಬವೊಂದರ ಕೂಸಾಗಿದ್ದಿರಬಹುದು ಅವಳು ಎಲ್ಲೋ ಅಂಬೆಗಾಲಿಕ್ಕಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ತನ್ನೊಬ್ಬನನ್ನು ಹೊರತುಪಡಿಸಿ ಲಕ್ಷಾಂತರ ಮುಖಗಳನ್ನು ನೋಡುತ್ತಾ ಬೆಳೆದಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಕೆಟ್ಟ ಮುಂಬೈ ಹಿಂದಿ ಆಡಿಕೊಂಡು ಗೆಳತಿಯರ ಮನೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಉಗುರಿಗೆ ಬಣ್ಣ ಹಾಕಿಸಿಕೊಂಡು ನವರಾತ್ರಿಗೆ ಗರ್ಭ ಕುಣಿದುಕೊಂಡು ಗಣಪತಿಗೆ ಮೋರಯ ಎಂದು ಸಮುದ್ರದಲ್ಲಿ ಒದ್ದೆಯಾಗಿ ಟ್ರಕ್ಕಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಓಲಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ಪ್ರಾಯಕ್ಕೆ ಬಂದ ಆ ಪೋರಿಯನ್ನು ಈ ನಗರ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸರಿ ಹೋಗುತ್ತದೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ಸರಿ ಹೋಗುತ್ತದೆ ಎಂದು ಹೇಳುತ್ತಲೇ ಯಾವುದೋ ಒಂದು ಗಳಿಗೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಹಠಾತ್ತನೆ ಕೈಬಿಟ್ಟಿರಬಹುದು ಆಗ ಅವಳು ನಡುಗಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಜಗತ್ತೆಲ್ಲ ಮುಂದರಿದಾಗ ಆಗ ಅವಳು ನಡುಗಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಜಗತ್ತೆಲ್ಲ ಮುಂದುವರಿದಾಗ ತಾನೊಬ್ಬಳೆ ತನ್ನ ಚಾಳಿನ ಮೋರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ವಿಕೋ ಟರ್ಮರಿಕ್ ಹಚ್ಚಿಕೊಳ್ಳುತ್ತಾ ಉಳಿದು ಬಿಟ್ಟೆ ಎಂದು ಕಂಗೆಟ
ಊಟದ ನಡುವೆಯೇ ಎದ್ದು ಚಪ್ಪಲಿ ಹಾಕಿ ಕಾಲು ಬಡಿಯುತ್ತಾ ಹೊರಗೆ ನಡೆದು ಬಿಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಗೆಳತಿರಿಯಿಂದ ತಪ್ಪಿಸಿಕೊಳ್ಳುತ್ತಾ ಸುಳ್ಳುಗಳನ್ನು ಆಡುತ್ತಾ ತನ್ನದೇ ಒಂದು ಗುಟ್ಟಾದ ಕನ್ನಡಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಅಡಗಿ ಕೂತಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಅವಳ ಬೈತಲೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ನರೆ ಬಂದಿದೆ ಎಷ್ಟು ಚೆಂದ ಇದ್ದೀಯಲ್ಲೇ ನಿನಗ್ಯಾಕೆ ಇನ್ನೂ ಮದುವೆಯಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಎಂದು ಮದುವೆ ಮಂಟಪದ ಸ್ಪೀಕರುಗಳು ಹಂಗಿಸುತ್ತಿರುವಾಗಲೇ ಮುಖದ ತುಂಬ ಹಠಾತ್ತನೆ ಒಂದು ಬಲಿತ ಕಳೆ ಶಾಶ್ವತವೆಂಬಂತೆ ಡೇರೆ ಹೊಡೆದು ಬಿಟ್ಟಿದೆ ಸಣ್ಣವಳಂತೆ ಹಠ ಮಾಡುವ ಹಕ್ಕನ್ನು ಅವಳು ಕಳೆದುಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದಾಳೆ ಒಂದೇ ಮಾರ್ಗವೆಂಬಂತೆ ಚಿಕಲ್ವಾಡಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಆಕಾಶಿ ಬುಟ್ಟಿ ಮಾರುವ ಪಕ್ಯಾನನ್ನೋ ಅಥವಾ ಕ್ಯಾಸೆಟ್ ಅಂಗಡಿಯ ಕೇಕೂನನ್ನೋ ನೆಚ್ಚಿಕೊಂಡು ತನ್ನ ದಿನಗಳನ್ನು ಹಾಳು ಮಾಡಿಕೊಳ್ಳುತ್ತಾಳೆ ಅಥವಾ ಯಾರಿಗೆ ಗೊತ್ತು ಕ್ರಮೇಣ ಲೈಬ್ರರಿಯ ಕಪಾಟಿನ ಕೆಳಗಿನ ಸಾಲಿನ ಮೂಲೆಯ ಯಾರೂ ಓದದ ಪುಸ್ತಕದಂತೆ ತನ್ನ ಪಾಡಿಗೆ ತಾನು ತೆಪ್ಪಗೆ ತಾಯಿಯ ಭಾವಭಂಗಿಯನ್ನು ಮೌನವನ್ನು ಗಳಿಸಿಕೊಂಡು ಕೂತು ಬಿಡುತ್ತಾಳೆ So uh non Canada speakers fret not I'm here to help Shalini Shalini Sain the name had some sparkle to it she had been living on this earth the past 39 years and suddenly her existence and Satyajit's had come close to one another perhaps he thought she was the child of a migrant family which had come here seeking a livelihood perhaps the family had never quite settled down she would have learned to walk somewhere in this city and grown up seeing lakhs of faces other than his speaking bombaya hindi painting her nails in a girlfriend's house dancing the garba during navratri going to the sea for the ganesh immersion shouting moria and returning home soaking wet and swaying in the truck this city had kept telling her everything will be all right and then suddenly let go of her hand she would have shuddered at that left alone in the chal she continues to apply vico turmeric cream on her face she is despairing angry gets up in the middle of a meal and puts on her slippers to go outside avoiding her friends telling them lies she hides in a secret mirror you're so lovely why aren't you married the loudspeakers from the marriage halls blare her face has suddenly aged the hair at her parting turned gray she has lost the right to sulk like a child she daydreams about pakya who sells paper lanterns or keku who runs the cassette shop slowly like a book on the corner of the lower shelf a book no one reaches out for she has acquired her mother's posture and her mother's silence Um, a lot of the stories in in the collection they feature very tender moments uh they, they're quite complex and involved love stories and i read somewhere that you once used to write love stories for people as a student love letters <laughs> yeah love letters <laughs> so as is this something that you can remember and that you've drawn on that your writing of love letters for your friends see when you are in hostel and you have published couple of poems you are named as a poet i would like that poet in a hostel gents hostel so any of my friends they wanted to write give love letter to somebody they will come to me and i will write love letters to them the problem was i should write every letter in a different style otherwise they will come to know one single fellow is writing all these letters so that's where my love lettering skill love letter writing skill uh you know you all in my hostels but there was a very absurd thing i will tell you i remember giving a letter to my friend and he gave it to his girl with some he kept it in some book all you know devdas kind of uh, communication so he gave it to the girl and next day we were going in a group and the girls group was coming and she had already received the letter and this man like a hero in our group he is looking at her and they shared a smile that was fine but at the same time i was also giving her a very pathetic smile that it was so absurd okay ye to aapka chal raha hai lekin mera bhi kuch hai isme you know that that kind of a very absurd pathetic smile i was giving so 
that time is there now anyway it is helping me to write my film lyrics which are most of the time love love lyrics only well i understand the impulse a writer always needs his praise or her praise so yes <laughs> yeah. um but i mean this could literally have come from one of your stories this this anecdote and and you've said in the past that your characters are not murals they are like line drawings and and you you like to see them almost as a uh, like a simple figure in a cartoon what did what did you mean by that no nee, it was actually i think it was i was talking about the people in mumbai yeah. there we can't there is no space for stretching yourself it is by default mumbai lives in a minimalistic way it's a big virtue i find it very spiritual there is no space one cot one cupboard one dressing table however small may be a home that home will be dreaming about a dressing table see these are all the metaphors of bombay a trunk few hangers a bucket and a mug that's all so there is no space to accumulate things it reflects your mental sensibility also because there also will not gather flab so i find mumbai as a very minimalistic way of living has itself so the home is only to come take bath eat and get back outside see in a way the people really live outside their homes so automatically the city becomes the home and that must be a gift as a writer because in your in one of the stories i remember you you say that people leave their cave like apartment uh, cave like homes or their cave like offices and enter the freedom of the city yeah. so all the real living is done in cinema halls on the street in tea shops this kind of thing so so all of real life is very available to a writer yes very much very much we are all it is like you know few friends having bath together outside when you take bath together that itself liberates you the entire city gives us a bath you know a soulful bath so you are exposed there nothing to hide where will you hide things from so that's why mumbai liberate even my mother usually what i'm saying is people from small town i come from a very small town temple town gokarna parents come to the cities and they don't like to they don't like the city they want to go back they say i want to go back send me home but no my mother would extend the tickets she will say don't book i don't want to go back to gokarna because she felt empowered in mumbai she felt very strong powerful in mumbai so that i like you know that i like about that city which empowers you gives you and another thing is anonymity anonymity is essence of creativity what we are trying to do in writing is becoming anonymous again but it is so silly that we try to again get these awards and you know <laughs> name the you know but it's it's nothing to do with it idea is to become anonymous and bombay it's a big virtue it's being anonymous so that's what i like that when you are anonymous you are free and you are responsible also it becomes i find it very religious and very spiritual act that's why bombay has haunted me and bombay has really groomed my sensibility and another aspect of this anonymous anonymity that you talk about it, it comes through in your characters in their rootlessness that some of them are migrants so they are drifters in the city but even the non migrants there is a sense that they are not rooted in their particular jati their caste their community and uh i've been reading that this this is unusual for at the time that these stories came out this is unusual for kannada literature that um a kannada reader would be uh, uh finding these people but unable to place them in that sociological landscape um and this is i think a deliberate act on your part yeah i mean because when i say dagdu parab dagdu parab is a alien character but marathi people will know his it is marathi name but when dagdu parab comes in my story what i am concerned is about what happens to him i don't know his bio data i don't know his social strata i don't know his upbringing nothing but he comes to me as a pure human representative so that liberates people that's like you know when i read a latin american story or i read any any translation story i don't know the things there i will look for that human matrix human content 
ultimately what is the plight of a man today so that is my concern as a reader so here also i think that is the plight of the man which has to connect with my reader so whether he is dagdu par whether she is asavari lokhande whether he is antariksha kothari it hardly matters so in a way that liberates me from my baggage of that regional context it it liberates me and hopefully it liberates my reader also i i hope i have answered your question i think yes, you have yeah. um, and the other thing that 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 fills the book is cinema um and perhaps that's not surprising for a for a book uh, set in uh, bombay but uh you you've also worked in film uh, writing scripts writing lyrics so it's a it's a huge part of your life how how does cinema feed into your writing cinema is a religion in our country that's what javed akhtar had said once so cinema we breathe cinema we you know like cinema is almost we have you know made our role models out of the cinema so cinema has been part of me i will tell you an anecdote small anecdote how much we loved cinema when i was in school my father was a school teacher so so it was not he was not getting a big salary or a very very meager salary but we will see every week film in our village tent theater every week there will be we will be seeing the film and we, we didn't have money so oh, in grocery shop we have that uh, book no at the end of the month you yeah. you give the write uh, your account uh, your account yeah so i will go to that uh, shop he will give me 5 rupees and he will credit it to in our account and we will go to the film so if you see that book i have that book with me it is very interesting if you see the pages will have sunlight soap 2 rupees tur dal 5 rupees cinema 5 rupees so we almost bought cinema in a grocery shop in this way so why i am telling you this cinema has been my driving force so many people say i mean many readers like you dear ones say that my films my stories are very much visually narrated when you can see things maybe because there is a unrealized director is working in my stories yeah. mm. so essentially you're saying it was one of the, es- the essential items on the grocery or yeah. grocery list yeah. um uh, along with the cinematic nature of the stories there is also this very strong absurdist humor in them i mean these stories are laugh out loud funny at times um uh, in particular i i just like to share with you there is a story about a couple who um have drifted apart and yet everything happens within their marital double bed so th- the man is shaving the woman is chopping vegetables all sorts of conversations but there's no sex so you know apart from the intimacy of the marital bed everything goes on in this bed and there are similar things including a runaway horse um i won't i won't give that ending away because that would spoil it but yeah. but is there a tradition of absurdist humor that you follow that you're drawing on when you when you write uh, these stories not exactly because i am not a uh, prolific reader and in kannada we don't have that kind of humor is we have got a different kind of humor is genre uh i think it that it has just happened in the process of writing but my father was a great sense of had a great sense of humor uh so i like humor good humor uh, maybe it has come like that and uh the other thing is that often when people write about mumbai you know there are major events whether uh, political events or uh, for example uh, catastrophic events that that sometimes form the backdrop or or in fact come to the center of the story you avoid that um some uh, the major kind of political flashpoints etc are just glimpsed through a little niche in your stories again why why do you do that it it, it always seems so so different from what other bombay writers do yeah i mean uh, i never thought from this angle but right i think i'm more worried about the man what happens to the man in a context than the larger picture the macro is there the, but what is happening to him like if some street is happening some some riots are happening in the street your news uh, channels and newspapers are there to report it i would rather go from the back door into the home 
and see what is happening. Why the young man who has gone in search of the job has not returned? What's happening? See, that's my angle. Like, you know, Taj Mahal, the tourist point of view is from one. But a special photographer like Raghur Rai, he goes behind from uh, on that Yamuna River and takes another angle. So, looking at the human world from a different, closer angle. That's my... So, for me, the riot was not the issue at all there. So, what's happening to this person at that moment? So, my focus is on the man. The, the characters are always foregrounded yeah, uh, yeah. In, in everything. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious that we're kind of... Um, yeah, we, we're almost at the end, I'm afraid. It, it's, it's a short session. There's so much more to, to say. But I'd love to give you the opportunity to, to ask. I think we only have time for two questions, or two or three questions. So, um, the, yeah, the lady there, um, if there's a mic, yeah. Good evening. I haven't read your book, so I can't draw a parallel from there. Uh, from what you mentioned, your characters stay in Mumbai, and it's like having a common bath and you become vulnerable. You don't become vulnerable, you become empowered. If I had been a character in your book, I would have been vulnerable because of the common bath and the exposure and to be exposed. So how do you, you know, on, you know, you just take one side of it that is being strong and not being vulnerable as, you know, I would have been vulnerable in that situation. Yeah, yeah. and both things will happen. So what you are calling yourself vulnerable, maybe it's a, it's a very strong point also. Maybe you read my stories and you will discover it, figure it out. Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman in the front. Sir, as a writer uh, who writes in a regional language, do translations create a conflict in your mind? The reason I ask this question is, on the one hand, you definitely want to get your work across to a larger audience. But on the other hand, hatatane can never be expressed properly as suddenly. Yes. You know, that, see, it all depends on uh, uh, the translator you have. The first thing is, I always feel, I am so lucky that I had a very good translator, that is Tejaswini Niranjana, who, by her, who herself is a poet. She wrote poetry. I tell it again, that, I think I told it in another session, translations are always safest in the hands of a poet. That's very important. Because poet is connected to the unsaid. So when you translate, the unsaid is not transferred uh, if it is not experienced. If there is a poet who is translating your work, your half battle is solved because he is connected to the unsaid and that unsaid gets translated also. So I was very lucky that Tejaswini did a great job with a lot of love. And we didn't have much of a, a conflict at all. Maybe certain small things, uh, where you have to, like some sentences are long in Kannada, she could chop it into two, three sentences. But it is, it was good, good exercise. But, uh, see, no original writer will ever say that translation is, uh, you know, like, because it's, some, it's a different language. It's a different language, different expression. Thank you. Uh, if someone has a very short question, we can accommodate that. Please, please be quick. Thank you. Uh, sir, Namaskara. Namaskara. Uh, so, how does your poetry influence your story and vice versa? Yeah. Poetry, I... gets over fast. <laughs> uh, basically, it's poet in me, I think, who is uh, manifested in all my short stories or even in uh, my short essays. I am a, I am haunted by images, I am haunt, haunted by metaphors, I am haunted by similes. That is because I am a poet. Maybe, and, I mean, I, because for, for, they are poets' tools. Even in short stories, I think the metaphors, similes, they haunt me. The pictures, uh, they haunt me because that's what it is. So, the, I will end it with a one uh, metaphor which is haunting me now is, uh, like, see, in present time, situation, all over the world, wherever it is, not only in India. See, any evolution is like a snake and ladder game. Snake and ladder game. We have all grown up playing that. The evolution is a big snake and ladder game. In the way, on the way, you will be getting so many snakes at the same time, so many ladders. And ladders are writings, thinkers, 
thought, art, these are the ladders. Inequality in terms of gender, racism, bias, you know, all greed, politics, these are all snakes. So, I treat each work of art as a ladder to move ahead in the snake and ladder game. And you know one thing, as you go, we are all in the, you know, in the highest peak of our evolution. But when you are reaching the goal, there is a big snake. <laughs> it is on number 97. So that snake, that snake is haunting all of us now, all over the world. The snake of greed, snake of disparity, snake of divisiveness, snake of this. So, and that snake, we should be careful that we should have right ladders to cross that snake. So that's what, that's how. So see, see, this image I told you, it made you realize things so fast, what it is all about. Same way in sto short stories, when the images and metaphors come, it becomes very easy for communicating an experience. That's why I feel I am indebted, you have got it right, I am indebted to the poet within me for uh, making my stories more tense, precise, and evocative or with a resonance attached to it. Thank you. So art as a ladder is a great way to uh, end the session. So thank you so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you all for being here too. Thank you, Mahesh. You did a, such a wonderful job with a lot of love. Thank you. Once again, our thanks go to John.